prior to starting this whole concept of importance and relevance of IP in law, I would like to actually, you know, highlight one particular aspect, which is, you know, maybe uh, with a lot of lawyers that we are more task oriented. So we always uh, take a micro view of uh, any subject and especially when it comes to artificial intelligence. Uh, so mainly when it comes to artificial intelligence uh, with regard to law, I would first like to highlight the concept of myths of artificial intelligence. And that's uh, prior to, you know, this whole concept of popular culture, which is taken over right now, watching a lot of uh, movies like uh, uh, Blade Runner, Terminator, uh, and, and we have got a very skewed concept of what AI is. And normally those myths which are there, so some of the common myths which I would like to highlight is like AI will take over the world. And this is a very, you know, a popular trope in science fiction. But in reality, uh, AI is only as powerful as the humans who create them. So there are concerns about AI and that uh, you might be actually uh, reading about it in, or uh, even through electronic media, you might be, uh, you know, having these uh, concerns about uh, ethics and misuse. Uh, but the whole concept of AI autonomously dominating any particular uh, community or humanity is really a far-fetched thing. Okay. So AI can feel and think like humans. Now, this is another concept when it comes to AI. And probably it is more uh, related to uh, humans as such. And we always think in terms of uh, anthropomorphic uh, ideas. So like, for example, even when you watch our cartoons or even when you actually, uh, you know, drive your car, you actually give it certain human, what do you call it, persona to those uh, particular objects. And uh, this is where actually it uh, really starts getting, uh, you know, over the top. So despite advances in machine learning, AI lacks consciousness. And this is, you know, I mean, a lot of people have this uh, concept that uh, AI is sentient, it has emotions, it has something called self-awareness. So it can mimic human behaviors and make decisions based on data. It doesn't have a subjective experiences like what humans have. Okay. So, and the third uh, myth which normally people have is AI will replace all jobs. Now, yes, uh, AI can automate certain tasks at present. I mean, we are in still uncharted waters. We don't know how exactly AI is going to pan out, but it's more likely to augment human capabilities rather than replace them entirely. Okay. So new jobs will emerge alongside AI technologies. It's not going to be a run-of-the-mill kind of thing that, you know, everybody has this doomsday scenario that we are going to uh, lose all the jobs and then what's going to happen to this whole 18th century, 19th century, 20th century concept of work. So, of course, humans will always continue to play a very crucial role in the uh, most of the industries. Uh, AI is another concept which comes that it is bias-free. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that. I mean, uh, AI systems, they always learn from data. And if that data itself is biased, they, AI can perpetuate them through feedback loops. So uh, bias in AI algorithms can lead to unfair outcomes. Uh, another concept which comes to is AI is infallible. I mean, that's one thing. It's not prone to errors. Uh, humans are prone to errors. So the data which we actually develop is definitely uh, bound to have certain uh errors uh, and and it's 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 really complex and unpredictable environment so uh, humans tend to make mistakes and definitely uh, with regard to AI it can lead to you know misrepresentations or uh, say for example uh, humans using uh, technology like AI to develop deep fakes and uh, you know certain uh, cyber security issues so uh, AI will solve all problems unfortunately I mean we are having this kind of uh, uh, technopoly concept where it comes to that uh, somehow technology is going to solve all of our human challenges or human problems. It's not definitely not a magical solution to every problem. Um, it requires careful design implementation and it requires constant refinement to be effective in specific domains. Okay, so and AI will create super intelligent machines. Uh, this is another problem actually when it comes to intelligence. Now we have something called AI which is narrow AI, we have certain things called uh, general intelligence AI, and we have something called super intelligent AI. Uh, we will not actually get into the concepts of uh, what do you call it, singularity. And, you know, I mean, super intelligence is something which is complex. It's it's long term goals. And, you know, it's definitely not in the near horizon that somehow AI is going to be super intelligent.
AI will understand everything. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, AI can process vast amounts of data and perform specific tasks and with definitely higher accuracy. It doesn't possess uh, understanding of consciousness or it operates based on patterns, you know, I mean, in a sense, uh, when it comes to deep learning, machine learning, which are subsets of actually artificial intelligence. And so understanding these myths can help demystify AI and foster more informed discussions about its potential limitations and certain societal uh, implications. So uh, another thing which I always tend to highlight before we actually delve into this whole concept of importance and relevance of AI is actually uh, artificial intelligence and popular culture. I mean, most of the concept what we actually derive right now AI is always comes from movies and especially films like, uh, I don't know actually if you've seen, seen the movie called 2001 uh, Space Odyssey uh, which had a computer called HAL 900 and uh, it, 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 it shows this whole concept of uh, sentient understanding and how it wants to destroy the whole spaceship. Okay, now Blade Runner, uh, Runner is another movie which was, I think, so in 1984. Uh, Ex Machina. Uh, we also have literature, I mean, books, if you have read uh, cyberpunk books, uh, written by William Gibson or iRobot by uh, Isaac Asimov and also Philip K. Dick, which he, uh, he has written, I think so, do Android's uh, Dream of Electric Ship. I mean, it's, it, it, it dwells on the subjects of AI's ethical, social and philosophical implications. Now, television shows when it comes to I think so. Most of us have seen Black Mirror. Uh, it holds a very dystopian view of what AI can perpetuate. And also, if you have seen uh, HBO series, I presume it was Westworld. Yeah, it explores the themes of consciousness and morality in artificial intelligence. Comics and manga is another thing which comes into foray. I think so. Uh, it was vision by Marvel Comics and uh, Astro Boy. That is by Osama Tezuka has written that uh, video games, music and art. I don't have to say about music and art when it comes to music, EDM, uh, social media and memes, which are actually, you know, prevalent right now. So AI in popular culture reflects society's fascination. It, 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 it talks about the hopes, fears, ethical concerns surrounding artificial intelligence. So these representations shape public perceptions and uh, discussions about the role of AI in our lives and its potential impact on society. I think so when it comes to AI and popular culture, uh, the most, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, important uh, movie which I foresee was Blade Runner. And I'm sorry, I said 1984, I think so it was 1982. It's uh, directed by Ridley Scott. Uh, it's, it's a very dystopian movie in which actually it talks about replicants and and, and they, are, they are basically virtually indistinguishable from humans. So it uh, raises questions about uh, identity, uh, empathy, ethical implications of creating AI beings. Uh, another movie that comes into foray is actually Terminator that was uh, directed by James uh, Cameron and that was a movie that was in 1984 and uh, it talks about, you know, uh, uh, it, it's a it's, it's an iconic uh, action film which introduces something called Skynet, a self-aware artificial intelligence that launches a nuclear apocalypse and uh, it talks about a time capsule in which actually a Terminator is sent uh, to save uh, humans as such from absolute destruction. Uh, another movie that comes to mind is Matrix. I think so it is what uh, it's a ground making uh, sci-fi movie which talks about uh, uh, sentient machines which are actually captivating in uh, humans and also Ex Machina and uh, another movie that comes to mind is Her and uh, Artificial Intelligence by Steven Spielberg. Okay, so now when it comes to popular culture, it always tends to highlight uh, uh, very uh, utopian or a dystopian aspects of uh, artificial intelligence. And it always garners certain worrying aspects that needs, uh, you know, kind of highlighting. So when it, when it comes to uh, worrying aspects, when it comes to AI, and definitely when watching a lot of popular culture, it comes to bias and fairness. So uh, I don't want to highlight uh, bias and fairness as such uh, very initially, but uh, most of the things which comes to uh, foray is privacy concerns, 
bias and fairness, uh, situations of job displacement, which I've highlighted previously. Then it comes to ethical dilemmas. Now, ethical dilemmas can be about uh, autonomous, semi-autonomous weapons, mm. issues related to cybersecurity, uh, ethical frameworks and guidelines, which need, uh, you know, uh, fine tuning. Then there are things like security risks and uh, existential risk where certain people actually think that, you know, I mean, some of one fine day, as I said, I mean, there's going to be a super intelligent AI and it's going to surpass everything and suddenly decide that humans are not something which is, uh, you know, uh, required on this particular planet because I think so being on the top of the food chain, we have caused enough destruction and we are actually the uh, most violent uh, biological machines and we have destroyed the ecology and it also leads to actually uh, unequal access and power. So so development and deployment of AI is actually most, most of it which what we see right now is actually in the Western world. And uh, it is widening the gap uh, between technologically advanced societies and technology uh, technologically legard societies. Uh, third world countries uh, shouldn't be mentioning India as a third world country, a developing country like India. So addressing those concerns definitely requires a very multidisciplinary approach and all these things. So another is a doomsday scenario. Now, this is another thing which actually, uh, you know, super intelligent uh, AI, again, it comes to loss of control. Uh, again, it comes to existential threats and there are unintended consequences. And this is where actually, you know, nobody knows how how truly the impact of AI is going to pan out. So maybe you have some unintended consequences because of, you know, uh, machine learning, deep learning techniques, uh, a, a human redundancy. And these are, you know, uh, kind of uh, doomsday scenario, which um, needs, uh, you know, to be addressed, uh, especially with uh, good regulation. Okay, now cases of bias and discrimination in AI is actually which needs highlighting is again, it comes to, uh, you know, uh, various domains. So it comes to facial recognition. Uh, again, it comes to, you know, predominantly the data is actually much more uh, prevalent in the Western Hemisphere where, where the skin tone color is white. So uh, some of the times actually the AI technologies fail to actually, you know, recognize dark skin individuals. So again, it comes to recruitment algorithms. Again, it comes to, uh, you know, that it's, it's uh, biased, it's gender biased. And another uh, thing is actually um, our society has been more or less actually a very, very patriarchal society, irrespective of whether it's the Western Hemisphere or whether it's, whether it's the Eastern Hemisphere. If you look at historical data, it's always actually male dominance when it comes to uh, politics, uh, when it comes to even dominance of uh, uh, culture, uh, even uh, uh, military aspects. It's, it's always actually, it's always been the male which has always been the dominant gender which has, uh, you know, been there and and whenever we feed data which is historically skewed towards this kind of gender bias has unintended consequences when it comes to actually gender selection and especially for recruitment even when it comes to criminal justice a lot of softwares have uh, you know which are based on uh, skewed algorithms uh, and certain risk assessment tools have, you know, uh, created problems where certain minority communities have always been, you know, made or targeted or, you know, because of certain inherent bias in the data. And of course, when it comes to credit uh, rating uh, agencies or credit scoring, when it comes to access to financial data, it again again comes down to that certain uh, uh, zip codes or certain geographical areas are, you know, uh, their disproportionality uh, has been, uh, you know, it's it's always actually certain areas have been, I wouldn't say targeted, but uh, because of certain skewed data, they have not been uh, taken into consideration. So when it comes to minority communities in certain areas, they have not been represented. And so when it comes to credit scoring, they have an absolute lack of access to decent finance, uh, whether it is in terms of term loans or whether it is in terms of actually having good access to banking sector. Okay, another comes to actually discriminatory practices in online advertisement. And this is a, another area which, uh, you know, it, it comes to for a, we will talk about certain uh, aspects of uh, uh, bias later on. So I will not actually dwell much more deeper into this particular issue at uh, present. And uh, we'll move forward with uh, importance and relevance of AI. So, this was just the myth which I was actually, you know, trying to 
you know, share prior to actually going into this whole concept of AI. So, so we'll start with, a, we already covered a brief overview. So we'll talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, it basically, what is AI? I mean, I, I'll, I'd rather give a very pedestrian definition of AI because I don't want to dwell into actually what is AI because nobody knows as such right now what really is AI, but it basically caters to or refers to simulation. Okay, so it just talks about simulation. It is not actual intelligence of human intelligence and machines enabling them to perform tasks that typically require human intelligence, such as uh, learning, problem solving, perception, decision making. So AI basically it encompasses various techniques and uh, approaches, including, uh, you know, uh, machine learning, uh, language processing, computer vision, robotics, expert systems. So we'll, uh, you know, uh, highlight certain aspects of, you know, what, what those uh, particular techniques are. So when it comes to AI, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence and law, uh, it talks about convergence or intersection. It's a uh, it's, it's an evolving field as, at present. So, and AI is being utilized in various aspects when it comes to in legal domains. So it comes to uh, contract review, it comes to legal research, uh, predictive analytics for case outcomes, and even talks about legal virtual assistance for basic legal advice. So, uh, but, but again, when it comes to uh, certain aspects where it needs highlighting is ethics, bias, future of legal practice. So this is, uh, you know, I mean, this is an ongoing process. It's a work in progress. So what is basically uh, important and relevance in AI it's, it's basically multifaceted. So when, when it comes to actually importance and relevance of AI, it definitely actually comes down to efficiency. So AI, uh, and, and when I talk about AI, I am talking about AI applications. Okay, so when it comes to, we, we are not going to talk about GPUs, we are not, not, not going to talk about, you know, tensor chips or, uh, you know, kind of network effects, which are there. Maybe we'll highlight it later on into the segment. Uh, but we talk about applications of AI and how it really helps, uh, you know, uh, lawyers or legal professionals in the legal arena. So first and foremost is efficiency. AI technologies can automate uh, mundane tasks, repetitive tasks, like, you know, I mean, basically a document review, contract analysis, legal research, and it saves a lot of time and resources for legal professionals. So, I mean, I mean, you can do something more uh, creative with your this, uh, you know, time. It also talks about accuracy. So AI algorithms can, you know, I mean, analyze vast amounts of legal data and with the kind of speed and accuracy. So reducing the human error in legal proceedings and decision making. Now, another aspect which I'll need to highlight is actually uh, over-reliance on uh, accuracy is another problem with AI. So human errors, I don't need to highlight with lawyers what we tend to actually do, forget our briefs and cars and taxis, forget our laptops. When it comes to even privacy concerns, I don't know, actually, uh, there are a lot of issues which are there, sharing emails with uh, uh, clients or, or people, unintended consequences of forwarding emails. Um, so, so there are lots of actually areas in which actually uh, there, there, there's bound to be human error but uh, if you use applications uh, based on AI, uh, definitely errors would be reduced, will not be eliminated in total. Uh, cost effectiveness, and this is another problem area because when it comes to cost effectiveness, it again comes down to uh, job redundancy. Okay, so once you start automating routine tasks, uh, so AI can help law firms, you know, or legal departments in certain corporates uh, reduce overhead cost, uh, and it basically provides affordable legal services to clients, okay? So, and another aspect which comes to foray is predictive analytics. So, uh, this is, this is uh, predictive analytics is, uh, is some of, uh, you know, who, who wouldn't like actually to know the future? So, we have tried, uh, you know, numerous instances, either with tarot cards, we have tried numerous instances with actually, you know, mm -hmm looking at astrology to predict certain or consulting certain oracles for what things are going to pan out. Or you might be having certain past historical data which you will actually, uh, you know, have access to and try to predict. Uh, it's it's like going to the races or, or actually the kind of, uh, you know, analysis or things or data or statistical data which is generated when you watch a cricket match. 
So uh, predictive analytics is something which is actually not based on mere assumptions or presumptions or basically consulting an oracle. It's basically, you know, it is going to predict future outcomes of certain cases and it helps lawyers to make informed decisions and to strategize. Okay, another aspect which is there is uh, access to justice. So when it comes to access to justice, legal tools can definitely actually, you know, can improve access to justice because it will make, uh, especially when it comes to actually virtual legal assistance, uh, it will make legal services accessible to, you know, populations who were not previously actually having the fair share of representation before, uh, uh, you know, courts and especially low-income individuals and maybe small businesses. Uh, innovation is another area which is actually, you know, it's, it's a work in progress and development of new tools and applications that will definitely improve legal practice and facilitate better outcomes for clients. Now, another aspect which comes to is compliance and risk management. And this is this is the area where AI can play a pivotal role. AI can help business ensure compliance with complex risk regulation. I don't have to say what kind of complex regulations uh, Indian individuals or corporates have to go through. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it can definitely actually, you know, highlight uh, or identify certain potential risk and liabilities more effectively than what humans can. Okay. So, so overall, when it comes to AI in, in the legal arena, it has the potentiality, it has, it has potentiality to transform the legal domain by enhancing efficiency, accuracy, accessibility. Okay. So, but then there, again, it's, it's, it's all subject to certain aspects on challenges, which are there in ethics, bias, regulations, and accountability. So uh, rather than... Uh, you know, dwelling much more on uh, how efficient or how actually AI is going to pan out, we'll, we'll talk about certain basic uh, definitions or certain terms which needs, uh, you know, definitely will you will have to understand them. And so it comes to, uh, when it comes to AI, we'll talk about machine learning. So what exactly is machine learning? It's basically a subset of artificial intelligence and it focuses on developing algorithms and statistical models to enable computers to perform certain tasks without explicit programming. Okay, so now basically this is this is where it is. I mean, previously you had to learn uh, programming or uh, second or third generation languages to actually program uh, your computers. So now you will have, you know, I mean, through machine learning, uh, by using various uh, different types of, uh, you know, uh, machine learning techniques like supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforced learn uh, learning, you can, uh, you know, I mean, basically, uh, and through data subsets and, and uh, algorithms, uh, a computer would actually start learning on its own. So actually, uh, another concept when actually it comes down to is natural language processing. Now, this NLP is one area which uh, uh, which is you know chat gpt or large language models uh, normally we talk about and as everybody must have heard about what chat gpt is capable enough of so nlp is basically a branch of ai which deals with interaction of computers and languages okay and 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 basically uh, any kind of languages so it involves the development of algorithms and models that enable computers to understand, interpret, and generate human language. So basically what NLP would be doing is actually, you know, language translation, uh, it comes to a sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is kind of actually uh, what, what basic opinion would be, whether it will be negative opinion, it would be whether it will be a, a neutral opinion, whether it will be a positive uh, opinion, through maybe pieces, blogs, or whatever you write, actually, it's able to do sentiment analysis. So chatbots and text summarizations, these are areas in which actually natural language processing would be, you know, uh, a major uh, kind of uh, technology. Uh, another thing which comes into foray is computer vision. Now, this is Computer vision is a field of AI that enables computers to interpret and understand visual information. Now, visual information, I think so most of us have heard about a thing called CAPTCHA and every time whenever actually you want to access data, you actually have to use those CAPTCHAs. You know, I mean, in a sense, I mean, they might be actually saying or, or, or talking about the chimneys, you know, highlight this thing or a fire hydrant. 
every time whenever you're clicking that capture, it's basically you are actually training a certain uh, computer to understand what uh, images are about. So computer vision is about and involves uh, developing algorithms uh, and models that allow computers to analyze and extract meaningful, meaningful uh, text or insights from uh, images or videos. Okay, so computer vision applications uh, are basically what image recognition, facial recognition, object detection, and it, it basically uh, computer vision is you know something which is used especially in uh, autonomous driving. So it'll be uh, you know maybe models like Tesla or maybe whatever new. Uh, autonomous vehicles we are talking about, which will be there. Uh, another thing which comes to fore is robotics, not your Terminator end robotics. So robotics combines AI and it combines mechanical, electrical, and electronic engineering. And it's basically, uh, you know, it's 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 a design construct and 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 it it, it it's uh, operating uh, basically those robots. Whether it is those robots will operate autonomously, semi-autonomously. Uh, so AI technologies such as machine learning and computer vision are always integrated in robotics. So they enable systems for perception, decision-making, interaction with the environment. So robotics application, they span around various industries, including manufacturing, healthcare, agriculture, space exploration. So there are, there are a lot of facets in which actually, you know, uh, AI uh, technologies uh, pan out. So now AI applications in uh, uh, you know in various industries. Now healthcare is one particular area in which actually AI can play a very tremendous slow role. Uh, image analysis is uh, very uh, you know important uh, when it comes to actually detection. Uh, I mean basically medical images of X-rays, MRIs, CT scans, and you know I mean in, in detecting abnormalities and uh, you know and and basically diagnosing diseases. I mean it can play a very important role. AI, uh, uh, especially also personalized medicine. So in a, AI basically can analyze patient data, which India has tremendous amount of patient data uh, and it includes uh, genetic information and medical history and it can tailor treatments and medications for individual patients. Drug discovery. So AI can accelerate the process of drug discovery by predicting certain molecular interactions. Okay. And it can identify uh, potential uh, drug optimizing designs. Uh, so, so basically AI can play a very pivotal role in healthcare industries. And especially in a country like India, India, uh, healthcare, you know, I mean, uh, access to healthcare for the lowest of the lowest rung of the society should have access to. So AI can play a very important role in a, in, in, in a, in a, in a sector like healthcare. Uh, finance is another uh, area in which actually, you know, AI can play a very pivotal role, especially when it comes to uh, fraud detection, uh, algorithms, uh, you know, basically can analyze financial transactions and patterns. So basically machine learning would actually, you know, highlight certain or, uh, you know, red, uh, red flag certain uh, patterns to detect fraudulent activities and prevent financial crimes. So another thing is algorithmic trading, actually. So I don't have to highlight that. Actually, most of uh, you must be knowing what is algorithmic trading. So it basically, you know, analyzes market data and it predicts price movements and executes trades automatically with minimum human interaction. Uh, risk assessment is another area in which actually, you know, I mean, uh, it comes to uh, uh, AI models can assess credit risk. So it plays a very important role in the banking sector. It can talk about market risk, operational risk by analyzing, you know, historical data and identifying potential risk and opportunities. So banking sector, yes, risk assessment, uh, insurance industry, can it can play a very, very uh, important and pivotal role. Uh, next is uh, retail. I don't have to actually highlight what is personalized recommendations. Most of you must be buying things from the net uh, and having access to, uh, uh, you know, Amazon or Flipkart or any of these. And, and you must be having an idea what personalized recommendations are all of them. So another uh, thing when it comes to inventory management, so it is, so it basically AI yeah, can, you know, basically forecast demand. It can optimize inventory replenishment uh, processes to reduce uh, certain stocks and uh, excess inventory. Okay, and and then there is a thing called a visual search. Now, visual search, I think so. 
the latest uh, ad which I see about this Samsung new phone, it talks about visual search, actually. You know, you just have to actually uh, circle an item and then actually it can search uh, the item for you. So this is, this is uh, another area uh, where, you know, it can play, uh, AI can play a very important role, especially and manufacturing, then, then it comes to predictive maintenance. And manufacturing right now, it's a very, very, very costly uh, uh, affair. So certain uh, AI algorithms can analyze, uh, you know, uh, sensory data from industrial equipment to actually, you know, predict certain maintenance or equipment failures which are there. So it reduces uh, reduces downtime and uh, maintenance costs. So predictive maintenance is, uh, you know, uh, AI can play a very important role. Uh, quality control, computer vision can actually, you know, uh, be incorporated in system to actually, you know, uh, look at products and detect def defects in those products and ensure product quality, improving manufacturing efficiency and reducing uh, wasting. Uh, supply chain optimization, this is another area which comes to, you know, optimizing inventory levels and savings and efficiency and improvements. Uh, uh, transportation, this is one area which is, you know, autonomous vehicles. And this is this is where actually, you know, uh, most of the computer vision uh, technology of AI is actually implemented. So self-driving cars, uh, trucks and processing, you know, sensory data, detecting obstacles and making real-time driving decisions. Uh, so this is about autonomous vehicles and then there's traffic management, I don't have to highlight actually you're uh, using that kind of uh, basic narrow way I, when you have access to Google Maps. Okay. So another thing is ride sharing optimization. This is another thing that actually most of it, most of us are using Uber and Uber is uh, companies like Uber. I don't need to mention names because I don't think so. I'm going to actually advertise uh, <laughs> companies on this platform. So ride sharing uh, optimization is with, you know, I mean, AI algorithms can actually, you know, uh, match drivers with, uh, you know, passengers and minimize certain wait times and travel distances. So this is, uh, you know, basically AI applications which are used in industries. Now, AI, when it comes to law, AI applications, especially AI applications, uh, when you, you talked about industry, so when it comes to AI in law, one thing that always comes to mind is basically legal research. And when it comes to legal research, uh, there is a lot of uh, data, whether it's legal documents, case laws, you know, precedents and, uh, you know, statutes. Um, and, and when it comes to legal research, I mean, what, what technology we had been using was actually extractive AI. And uh, now somehow from extractive AI, we have moved on into the domain of generative AI. So basically, uh, you know, legal research uses uh, natural language processing and machine learning, and it can actually, you know, as I said, from extractive AI, we are moving on to, uh, you know, generative AI. Basically, I mean, uh, it's 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 a transformation uh, from just getting legal text, extracting key concepts, but uh, you know, generating uh, search results based on generative AI platforms is uh, a thing which uh, a league apart from extractive AI. Okay, so, and contract analysis. So AI tools can, you know, review contracts and it can identify, it can red flag uh, certain uh, potential risk. It can explain certain key terms. It can explain clauses. So, and it can identify certain risk areas. So contract, contract analysis software, it uses machine algorithms, machine learning algorithms to extract relevant information and it can categorize clauses. It can flag potential risk and patterns. And uh, another area which comes to is predictive analytics. I mean, this is another thing actually. So tarot card reading, I mean, but basically you're using statistical models, uh, machine learning. So you can analyze past cases, data and legal precedents and AI models can actually predict the likely outcomes of similar cases and inform legal strategies, uh, how to form the deal. Another area is document review. And document review, I don't need to highlight actually uh, what kind of, you know, I mean, basically when you're doing due diligence, the kind of amount of information that has to be, you know, you, know, you have to go through is just volumes and volumes of documents and volumes and volumes of data. So it can help you actually in terms of uh, you know, uh, basically uh, areas in litigation, due diligence, and compliance uh, purposes because it can classify documents, it can extract relevant information, it can prioritize certain documents for review by 
human attorneys and uh, you know virtual legal assistance i mean basic uh, legal advice document drafting contract generation services it can be actually you know uh, given to legal virtual legal assistance and compliance and regulatory analysis so ai definitely it helps businesses ensure compliances and legal regulations and uh, regulatory changes that may impact their particular operations another area is litigation support so ai tools can assist in litigation support task and you know basically case management and trial preparation so this is in crux how ai tools actually you know help increasing and enhancing efficiency. So what are the opportunities which are, you know, uh, available when you use certain uh, AI applications? Now, enhancing efficiency and productivity, uh, I don't think so it needs uh, highlighting, actually, because uh, legal research, document review, uh, contract analysis, enabling legal professions, to, uh, it will it will definitely save a lot of time and it will actually you know basically it will lead you to a certain higher uh, areas in which actually your overall overall efficiency and productivity in legal practice will increase uh, cost reduction uh, uh, a very very dicey area actually i would not not say it's exactly an opportunity it is also an opportunity for legal firms maybe but it's also a kind of a red flag for uh, employment uh, when it comes to cost reduction in most of the legal firms. So anyway, so improved accuracy and consistency. Definitely, actually, when you look at uh, humans, I mean, you have a lot of factors which actually, uh, you know, compare human and AI. Uh, humans have a tendency about mixing uh, emotions. We are, at times, we are tired. We are... You know, the motive uh, compass is somehow skewed and we tend to make mistakes. Uh, the same thing is not, uh, you know, uh, possible with AI. So, I mean, it, it definitely actually comes down with improved accuracy and consistency. So, AI-powered tools can analyze, I mean, vast amounts of data and uh, and with speed, which is unprecedented. So, so uh, it, it definitely leads to better accuracy and consistency. Uh, predictive analytics... Uh, Okay, it, it tends to be kind of uh, circumlocution, but definitely, actually, it's one of the opportunities because you can be a uh, toothsayer, you can be an oracle, actually. When, when, when clients come to you and they ask your opinion, you can actually do a very good SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And you can make informed decisions, you can strategize, and this can lead to, you know, better outcomes, actually, for clients. Uh, so if you have predictive analytics, I mean, this will definitely have to, you know, I mean, uh, another area which comes to promoting access to justice. Now, this is an opportunity for people who never had this kind of access to uh, justice. And, uh, you know, I mean, virtual legal assistance can actually play a very pivotal role on this and online legal services. Uh, you have certain areas in which actually now, right now, when even when you're filing taxes and things, you're using a lot of AI, which is actually, you know, reducing certain... Uh, baggage which was involved in consultation or getting you know i mean basically a salaried class when he actually doesn't need much of uh, consultation when it comes to actually filing returns so 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 basically you have all these things which are automated which are actually using chat box the uh, chat bots and you are actually uh, utilizing a lot of uh, uh, virtual assistance when when you're filing tax returns or when you're actually even drafting uh, previously, we used to have precedents and you had books and, you know, then you had certain forms which you could access online. But basically, you had to extract those forms when you were uh, there online. So you had to have certain key terms which you could put into Google search or any of the search engines. I will not, again, I made the mistake of highlighting certain uh, companies, which I don't think so. There's a platform to highlight those names and promote them. But anyway, so search engines, so we could do extractive AI. We were using at one point in time. So uh, basically, a lot of people from low-income groups and you know small businesses can have uh, better access to uh, justice. So now, when it comes to uh, improving decision making and case management, it definitely actually helps in enhance decision support compliance and risk management, better client services and satisfaction. So areas you know i mean uh, again again when it comes to actually you know role of uh, legal professions actually it's it's much more with this kind of opportunities uh, using ai you can focus more on strategic thinking 
you can have much more of better of client relationships uh, better management and uh, you know i mean these these are these are areas in which actually you know this is going to actually uh, or or maybe actually even when it comes to education it can help uh, judges you know it can assess them in actually you know analyzing legal precedents case law statutes to support their decision making so that also plays a very informed and you know uh, pivotal role uh, when it comes to access so how do you enhance efficiency and productivity by using ai now when you use ai applications you are automatically you know automating routine task uh, so legal research document review administrative work that needs actually you know automated uh, task uh, can be done by uh, utilizing ai so you can basically focus i uh, don't need to highlight it again and again Yes, it speeds up the process. It improves accuracy and consistency. Uh, new services and innovation because AI is all, uh, I mean, it's, it's basically a work in progress. So enhances search and retrieval, uh, improves efficiency and, uh, you know, uh, reduces compliance risk and it manages risk much better. Is It enhances search and retrieval uh, it uses, uh, again, it comes to predictive analysis, analytics, uh, and it optimizes resource allocation. So how do you actually go about this? You know, it basically facilitates collaboration and communication. And this is one area in which actually, you know, this particular uh, lecture, I would not say a lecture webinar, is somehow it's a very collaborative effort in which actually you have uh, experts, uh, so-called experts. I would not say I'm an expert. Okay, so-called experts, end users who would be advocates, who would be students, and other stakeholders who would be actually part of this thing. So basically, it's a collaborative effort. Same thing is it with AI. So you can get you know uh, real-time information actually if you are actually uh, uh, updates and collaborative features which are part and parcel of uh, the new AI software. Uh, would not call it software, would call it applications. So how do you go on actually, you know, the second aspect which comes to uh, importance is promoting access to justice. So now affordable legal services, okay. Well, and this is this one area which actually, uh, affordable legal services, AI implementation cost at present is quite high when it actually look at uh, the kind of hardware or cloud computing subscriptions which you would be utilizing, uh, you would need. So, but definitely, actually, it uh, down the line, uh, you can say that it would lead to better affordable legal services because basically legal advice and assistance to individuals and you utilizing uh, uh, robotic legal assistance, software, software robotic legal assistance. Okay, so certain self-help tools, I don't need to highlight what self-help tools are, Remote consultations, and this is another area which actually, you know, virtual legal services, eliminating geographical individuals, so you can get access to experts based in uh, any particular area is not actually uh, geographic specific, domain expertise. And, uh, you know, I mean, basically what you need is actually an internet connection. So not only in terms of ICT, but also in terms of actually, you know, having uh, uh, different applications which are not based on, uh, you know, Indian platforms. So language translation, it comes to uh, another thing actually, and and uh, needs to highlight is actually, especially in a country like India where it is, you know, languages are unbelievable. So basically, and uh, we still have this uh, kind of most of our acts and most of the statutes are in a language uh, which is uh, which is not actually I would say that which is the predominant language of internet but it's an Indian language which is not actually uh, specific to India as such so we need certain language translation applications which uses AI and uh, you know legal to travel uh, legal information retrieval basically so document automation and uh, tools that would help individuals Retrieve legal information and precedents to inform legal decisions and actions. Another area is dispute resolution. So platforms would provide accessible, efficient, cost-effective dispute resolution services, making justice more accessible to individuals. And uh, education and awareness. And this is another area which actually, I think, so please playing a, a very major role in actually 
awareness. So do you at present you don't need AI, but down the line maybe AI technologies can be used to develop educational resources, uh, tutorials, interactive tools uh, that increase public awareness, and also uh, you know kind of professional development skills that needs actually you can do it by way of uh, AI. So so improving decision making. Uh, and case management, utilizing predictive analytics, case assessment and prioritizing, uh, document review and analysis, uh, legal research, citation analysis it can be improved by utilizing uh, AI, uh, workflow optimization, uh, document review and analysis, workflow optimization. These are areas in which AI powered workflow optimization tools will streamline case management processes by you know, automating repetitive tasks, managing deadlines and milestones, optimizing resource allocation and real-time updates. Uh, risk assessment and mitigation, we have already highlighted those things. So, and decision support systems, which are actually, you know, will provide, definitely provide legal professionals with data-driven insights and recommendations to support decision making. And definitely it comes to performance analytics. So certain metrics and key performance indicators are you know, better in, case, in terms of case management, uh, client satisfaction. This is uh, you know areas in which actually AI plays a very crucial role in improving decision making and case management in the legal domain by providing data-driven insights, automating repetitive tasks. And so, I mean, basically, uh, and, uh, you know, comes to mind certain uh, uh, software. Uh, I think so. What comes to mind is Ross Intelligence is one AI powered legal research platform. Uh, then there is something called Kira Systems. There is Lex Machi Machina. There is uh, Case Text. There is Neotologic, uh, Everlaw, uh, ContraPod, AI. Uh, Blue Gene uh, Legal. So these are different uh, AI softwares, uh, applications, which can, you know, help lawyers to assess legal risks, predict uh, case outcomes, make informed decisions, contract review, contract analysis. So some, I sh again, I mean, it should not have, you know, highlighted those uh, company names, but anyway, those are few softwares and applications we can use. Uh, now, when we come to, uh, we had this very, optimistic view about AI based on certain economic parameters, because I mean, basically, when it comes to law as such, we have much more predominantly concentration is on way of economic parameters. And that is where actually efficiency, productivity, uh, better decision making, uh, all these things come into foray. But when it comes to challenges, uh, there are a lot of issues which are there, which is actually in terms of human rights, in terms of actually uh, bias and discrimination, it's, it's actually a, a kind of uh, uh, attack on your uh, on your basic uh, fundamental rights. Uh, so, 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 what are what are those challenges which are there? Uh, you know, I mean, basically, algorithmic bias and discrimination. So, there are several challenges. One, first and foremost, is bias and fairness, and this is. AI algorithms are dependent on what? It's basically, when you say they are biased, they are dependent on the data that is used to train them. Especially when it comes to a country like India, um, we have a data black. I, I don't think so we can, I mean, I, mean, I, I would not be 100% sure, but the kind of liability we place on data is, is skewed. So, so, so basically, uh, a country like India has a tremendous variation in terms of a language, culture, food, even in terms of uh, worship. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very diverse country. And uh, when you look at data sets, when it comes to any country, uh, you know, especially a country like India, you would tend to have data which is inherently, you know, um, would be would be not directly biased, but somehow or the other actually fundamentally uh, uh, certain areas which would creep in, which would be biased and which would amount to discrimination, especially uh, when you have a very, 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 very patriarchal society where uh, male dominance has always uh, preceded gender justice. So I'm, I'm being very India specific, but the same thing is applicable even in the West, actually, despite the fact actually there has been a lot of uh, 
what do you call it, uh, pivotal uh, areas in which actually the Western Hemisphere have addressed certain issues with regard to bias, discrimination, but but they are more or less actually, maybe when it comes to, they are more color specific and they are more actually uh, biased in terms of gender and access to uh, freedom of expression and uh, issues. Um, so bias and fairness is, as I said, I mean, it's, it's uh, very related to the kind of data which is actually, you know, which is being supplied. So, so basically, if the data is skewed or if it's faulty or it is biased, the systems will definitely actually would be biased, and a uh, lot of discrimination would keep in, creep in, and uh, there will be trust issues, and and integrity in the legal system would be, you know, would be not be. I would not say integrity in the not in the legal system. It would actually, you know, there would be trust issues with the whole uh, legal system. If if you allow and this this is another area which again I need to highlight is actually over reliance on actually uh, tools. Now this is this is one thing which we always actually used to, you know, when we were trainees or we were when we were uh, working as uh, you know in law firms, we were always taught not to rely too much on precedents. Uh, so you have to have analytical skills. You ought to have certain skill sets so you don't spend your three years or five years in a vacuum. You have developed certain legal reasoning skills which you need to implement them. So basically, uh, it's it's not actually you know in a vacuum. Over reliance on AI for anything would be a problematic area, especially when you rely too much on uh, large language models like uh, Chat GPT, or when you rely too much on uh, uh, on on AI because AI tends to hallucinate. Hallucinate hallucination is not the same thing with which. I'm referring to hallucination is basically coming out with false data because it is based on data which is actually biased and uh, discriminatory. So it will tend to hallucinate. So you will get false outputs. So it's it's basically the same theory like garbage in, garbage out. So it's it's basically if you have data which is skewed, which is untrustworthy, it is biased, discriminatory, you'll have um, systems or AI applications would be absolutely biased and discriminatory because your algorithm is based on that data. So transparency and accountability. Now, this is area in which actually very important. Uh, we always like uh, procedures to be transparent. You know, we always like uh, whenever, uh, when we are dealing with authorities, when we are dealing with um, with uh, power figures, we like, like things to be transparent, you know, I mean, in a sense, it should not be opaque. And uh, when it comes to AI, most of the algorithms are based on deep learning and deep learning, uh, deep learning is something like a black box, you know, it's, it's very complex and opaque. And how those decisions are actually come down to AI, it's, it's pretty, pretty silent on, the, on that. So, so lack of transparency, would be, you know, create uh, issues with regard to even accountability and due processes, particularly in, uh, you know, legal contexts where explanations for decisions are required. So basically, even when you come down with a judgment, I mean, you require reasoning. So so if if AI is being used in, in the legal domain, uh, it needs to be transparent, it needs to be accountable. And then there is another aspect of data privacy and security. Uh, this is this is this is one area in which actually substack stacks uh, government semi government bodies and you know uh, tech companies data privacy and security i mean this this is a huge black hole which has not been addressed or it has been addressed by certain laws which are absolutely uh, what do you call it uh, reliant on uh, on on data which is very uh, based in based in historical uh, context so when it comes to data privacy and uh, security uh, sensitive data confidential information or access to you know uh, your client attorney privilege your client records patient records so strict privacy standards to protect information and especially unauthorized access or misuse of information so India has the new uh, Data Protection Act, and so has EU. Uh, so these are certain areas in which data privacy and security, this is a main challenge area in AI. Uh, another area when it comes to ethical use of AI, I mean, legal domain, uh, important questions is the role of lawyers. And again, actually, ethical dilemmas are bound to creep in when you are actually using uh, AI tools. So 
you, you use tools which uphold ethical standards and protect the interests of the clients. Okay. Again, when it comes to regulatory and compliance, regulatory requirements, standards governing legal practice, data protection, and prof professional uh, ethics. So uh, confidentiality, again, comes into foray interest and, and, and attorney-client privilege. Uh, and again, it comes to quality and reliability of data. The quality and reliability of data is, again, as I said, I mean, I mean basically what kind of training data, the robustness of the al algorithms which are there. Uh, so they... Legal professionals professionals need to criti critically evaluate the accuracy, reliability, and uh, limitations of AI tools. And as I said, uh, over reliance on any kind of tools is damaging. It is it is not something you know. I mean, I mean, basically, you can have autonomous vehicles, but that does not mean actually some of you have a hands off approach and start actually playing games when you are actually on the right behind the wheel. So kind of uh, a, a supervised uh, system is very necessary when you're using AI tools. So again, it comes to impact of legal employment, legal workforce. Yes, certain areas will be actually, you know, uh, will be made redundant. And uh, this is one area uh, which requires, you know, maybe you will go into from being a professional, uh, you know, legal uh, paralegals to maybe you will become an AI programmer or you'll, you know, become an ethicist or you will become, or you will develop better frameworks. So these are areas in which actually, you know, uh, new uh, forays can be developed. And uh, uh, algorithmic uh, bias, as I said previously, based on, you know, basic bias training data. And, and, and it leads to a very disparate impact and what what is that disparate impact is is, is like you know uh biased algorithmics algorithms used uh, you know risk assessment tools and 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 basically bias training data would lead would definitely lead to something uh you know let us say for example target uh, certain minority communities or certain uh, colored communities when you talk about west are actually you know because of certain bias training data would lead to harsher sentence so i mean basically this is not uh, the outcome which is desired and 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 so basically if you have a very biased training data it would lead to a very disparate in impact so it will lead to harsher sentencing and basically and 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 especially marginalized communities so and and it will exacerbate those existing inequalities which are existing in society so again when it comes to algorithmic bias when you're developing certain as tools it comes to lack of diversity in development teams and this is this is one uh, problem you know i mean lack of diversity is also because we don't have much more of trained professionals uh, we don't use a multi faceted approach to developing ai tools so it is it is very homogeneous and actually being homogeneous so it does not have lack of diverse perspective so you don't have ethicists into actually those development tools you don't have people who have who come from liberal arts background you don't have people who are into policy making who are uh, technocrats so so lack of diversity in development deals and also certain marginalized communities also need to be a part of that team um now when when you have this kind of uh, you know, lack of diversity, you have very opaque uh, decision-making uh, process. So utilizing deep neural networks, and when it comes to deep neural networks, it's basically a black box. So you have absolutely, it becomes very, very difficult to address bias when, uh, you know, you are using uh, deep learning techniques and opaque decision-making systems. And of course, I don't need to highlight that, you know, basically whenever you're using uh, unsupervised uh, machine learning techniques you have certain uh, feedback loops which would definitely actually you know in terms of uh, will perpetuate and uh, you know reinforce certain existing biases which are there so this is one area which is you know i mean uh, uh, and and would lead to fur further marginalization of certain uh, sections of society so how do you actually have an upholding uh transparent uh, holding transparent and accountability now first and foremost is actually you know kind of uh what do you call it uh clear communication now this this is one area which is important when it comes to uh ai um clear communication in terms of actually uh what your outcomes are going to be 
Uh, so, so unbiased communication is very important when it comes to clear communication. So, so what are the legal professionals? Uh, basically, what they should do is actually, you know, uh, when it comes to clients, you should be able to actually explain where you have used AI systems to actually come down to decision making. Now, uh, uh, another aspect which comes to is explainable AI, utilizing AI systems that are explainable, meaning they provide transparent explanations um, for their decision making and predictions. So uh, should be able to, legal professionals especially, should be able to uh, interpret and reason behind uh, AI generated outputs. Documentation now, whenever you're developing certain AI uh, softwares or AI applications, uh, their design, their development processes, data sources, algorithms used should be actually, uh, you know, basically it should be not only documented, it should be periodically reviewed. It has to be audited by all the stakeholders and regulatory authorities. Okay, so audit becomes very important. And here I'm talking about AI audit. Okay, so auditability is another area which comes to uh, foray. Then there is a question of a risk assessment. So you have to actually assess risk, potential risk associated with AI uh, deployment and uh, implement measures to mitigate those risks. So now auditing is another aspect which I already have uh, mentioned it. And this, this, is, this has to be taken into consideration whenever you are developing certain legal tools or whenever you are actually you know, establishing certain ethical standards, procedures, needs to be established for auditing AI procedures and AI systems. Uh, then it comes to data governance, the quality, integrity, and security of data. So uh, used in AI systems. Again, that needs uh, this thing, accountability mechanisms, roles, responsibilities, and mechanisms for oversight and governance, uh, ethical guidelines. The list is endless. Okay, so continuous monitoring and improvement. This is one area which I always keep, keep on saying it because AI is work in progress. It is not something which is standstill, which is, uh, you know, uh, daily, day in, day out, as the kind of, what do you call it, uh, hardware mechanism is actually improving, uh, the kind of cloud computing mechanism, which is improving the, the graphic processing units or the central processing units or the ten, 10 hour processing units are actually being utilized. And it's becoming more and more competitive it's becoming better and better. Okay, so transparency and accountability. Uh, we have uh, so so basically, what can you actually you know you do it by way of actually how do you you know identify, mitigate, and prevent bias in AI systems? Uh, diverse and inclusive data. So this is one area which actually you know would include the uh, systems algorithmic audits which we talked about, ethical guidelines and standards. Diverse development teams, as I said, I mean, it has to be ethicists, it has to be uh, lawyers, policymakers, technocrats, and, uh, you know, utilizing user-centered user design. Uh, this, sorry about the noise. Uh, so user-centered design, this is very important, actually. Uh, and a continuous evaluation mechanism, this, this is um, very pivotal. So upholding principles of quality, uh, those principles is uh, pivotal. I think so. I don't know what's the time actually. I think so. We've gone one hour, 15 minutes. Should we continue with this? Yeah, let, let me complete the whole uh, aspect and then we can go for a QA and a actually. So professional judgment and oversight job displacement. Now, this is another area in which actually, you know, uh, I've already highlighted the concept about, you know, what, what kind of actually displacement uh, would be done. So, uh, you know, it, it, it basically uh, talks about... Um, multifaceted approaches. So, so I'll, I'll directly go into future direction and implications. So, so what are going to be the potential future developments in AI and law? Ethical AI, explicable AI, this is one other thing because it basically, I mean, the decisions would be uh, based on certain AI uh, systems that needs explaining. Responsible AI governance, AI governance for good. Uh, AI is basically human augmentation. So actually AI and human augmentation, workforce transformation, privacy preservation, uh, global collaboration, AI and environment sustainability, AI and cultural impacts. So when it comes to, you know, kind of what, what would be the system that would need 
deployment. So integration of AI and legal curricula, that is very important. Actually, I mean, India is a AI laggard when it comes to implementation. Certain uh, aspects of AI is not highlighted at present. Most of the industries are somehow very circumspect in actually utilizing AI tools, no matter what we say that. Uh, and basically, when it comes to the startup domain, uh, we have an absolutely, what do you call it, uh, lack of data sets. Now, when it comes to very important to, uh, platforms such as Google now, AI, uh, in India, uh, some of the maximum amount of users are based on Android. And Android is day in and day out um, collecting data. And it is actually enhancing uh, Google AI uh, tremendously. Uh, basically, uh, AI startups don't have access to that kind of data. Okay, so Amazon has a tremendous uh, access to data when it comes to actually consumers. Uh, you don't have that kind of data which is there. So, so, so you have this kind of a system in which uh, there is an absolute uh, lack of data, la lack of data sets. I would say that. So, I don't know actually how how really uh, startups would be able to you know somehow circumvent circumvent those challenges or address those challenges when you have a lack of data. Um, there is a lot of. Uh, Experiential learning opportunities uh, uh, available when it comes to impact of AI and legal education. Okay, and and and, and coming to the same foray of actually uh, data sets. Uh, somehow, I'm not very convinced about actually you know how government can help actually uh, AI. You know, I mean, I mean, basically, uh, let's be very clear. Actually, there's a lot of uh, issues when it comes to uh, individuals who have talked about uh, talked about um, what do you call it identity or when it talks about uh, certain issues of ai uh, that somehow ai is going to be uh, you know kind of a doomsday scenario um, or or saying that the platforms which are there somehow they have a, somehow access to much more amount of data i mean basically it's a fact that the platforms are in business and so they are not an actual uh, what do you call it, a non-profit organization. So please actually, one has to be very clear about those things. They have access to uh, data sets uh, and, and, and and basically they are into, um, what do you call it, commercial transactions. So so please don't confuse those uh, two aspects of it. So upskilling and re uh, reskilling initiatives, this is going to be, a, you're going to be a student for life. Ethical and regulatory considerations, I don't, I mean, it tends to be circumlocution. And critical thinking and analytical skills will not be able to, you know, replicate anything. So we come to a kind of a, uh, an overview of uh, what I had, you know, in a nutshell, importance and relevance of AI. Uh, so I think so I will actually, you know, now open the floor for any questions that needs to be addressed. And uh, we are in uncharted waters, so don't actually ask me certain things, which is actually how GPU is going to be utilized or how uh, Google is going to use tensor chips or you know things like that. But whatever is applicable to AI and law, yes, I'm more, more than welcome to actually address those questions. Uh, yes, please. So meanwhile, sir, on our registration form, uh, I'll just take questions from there. Uh, okay. The first question is, sir, can you recommend any AI tools for drafting? Uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are uh, there are lots of AI tools actually which are uh, AI tool AI tools for drafting. Uh, I think so. Chat GPT. Uh, are you talking about a law firm or are you talking about a, uh, what do you call it uh, uh, individual? Chat so GPT, for a legal professional. For a legal professional, I think so. I think so. Ross is one uh, particular uh, you know. Uh, what do you call it, uh, AI tool, which I can recommend. Uh, then there is, uh, I think so, case text is, I think so, uh, there. There is, what else is there, actually? Then there is Kira Technologies, if I'm not actually uh, mistaken. Lexus, Nexus, Context is there. Then there is Westlaw Edge. Uh, what else is there? There's Neota Logic. There is Kira Systems. So a lot of, lot of uh, softwares are available. Then there is contract pod AI. There is a legal sifter. Then there is a software called Gable Document, which is there. Uh, 
But the problem is actually these are all subscription based. So that is one, it's not free. Chat GPT 3.5, I think so is free. So you can actually, you know, some of our rudimentary contract drafting, you can actually utilize that. And especially it comes with a warning that do not actually have over-reliance on AI for contract offering, definitely not. Uh, so I think so I have uh, addressed that particular question. So could we take another one actually, if you don't yes, sir. <clears throat> So the next question is, in the recent past, we saw a case where a person in Belgium ended his life due to his interaction and over-dependence on chat box. So in this scenario, who should be held responsible? The chat box or the developer? Ah, ah, no. <laughs> this is a very uh, gray area. Again, actually, uh, it comes down to ethics. Okay. So, and, 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 and it's much more a larger perspective because if we actually hold developers liable for it, actually going to come down with a thing in which actually the whole industry of AI would come at a standstill. It then again, then there would be another winter AI. So will not actually, it's, it's again, when it comes to education, it is also kind of end user over-reliance on uh, uh, chatbots or, you know, I mean, this, this is another area which needs uh, a lot of consideration. And that's a gray box. Again, as I said, I mean, if you actually hold the developers li liable for the, uh, you know, this kind of issue, it can lead to uh, AI winter. And so definitely progress would stop. But again, when it comes to, so it's, it's a gray area. I don't have a definite answer for it, but down the line when actually things will really consolidate and actually you would have real good regulatory mechanism in place. And when you have good algorithms, which are not actually are biased, discriminatory, and you have very good data sets, Ultimately, when it comes to designing systems, it will always be the developers would be liable for it. And this is this is my personal opinion. It's not actually because, uh, as I said, it's a work in progress. If you actually hold developers at present liable for it, you will have an AI winter. Okay, so you don't want to do that. So at present not, but yes, once you actually reach a stage where general intelligence is a common thing, yes, you will definitely hold developers responsible for it because they had used algorithms which uh, led to machine learning, deep learning initiatives. So yes, ultimately, yes, it will come down to, as a, it's a personal opinion, definitely not. I would not say that you cannot uh, hold AI responsible because you have not still given it a legal status as such. You don't hold it. I mean, leaving around Saudi Arabia, which has given, you know, citizenship, it's still not a legal person. So you can't hold AI responsible. So ultimately the developers are responsible at present, but again, holding them responsible. The problem is AI winter. So you don't want that. So I hope I have addressed this. Okay. So the next question is, can you sum up what aspects of legal profession cannot be disrupted by AI? Cannot be disrupted by AI at present or in the future? I think so in the future. We are worried about the future. <laughs> In the future, see, as I said, it's uncharted waters and, and, and all technologies, AI-based, whether it's machine learning, deep learning, NLP, natural language processing, you know, uh, robotics, everything is work in progress. So you definitely, I mean, even when people see both, both the concepts of doomsday scenario is not an answer to it. Okay. So, and definitely actually being too optimistic that, you know, no, no, nothing is going to change. And we are just going to actually be nostalgic about how we used to actually work. And, you know, I mean, uh, just have access to extractive AI and not have generative AI. Yes, you are, uh, you know, not addressing the problem. Uh, but yes, definitely when are you, when you are going to use AI tools, it's going to free up your time. And it's definitely going to lead you towards better aspects of uh, law, legal research. Yes, maybe you will be able to do better legal research. Uh, philosophize. Yes, you will be able to do that. You'll be having better client uh, management, uh, access to clients and, 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 and things. So, I mean, you don't really have a definite answer for it. And I'm, I'm being very honest about it. Even I have no clue what's going to pan out tomorrow because the way actually the, uh, you know, uh, uh, convergence of biotechnology, 
convergence of nanotechnology, uh, even uh, 3D printing, industrial 4.0, and uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning, NLP, robotics. You don't really know. I mean, these are these are you know, I mean, uh, outcomes which we are not yet prepared for. Yes, you can have a rough outline, as I said, but but nobody has a sheer cut answer to the thing that how it's going to be. Because I mean, predictive analytics is not something which we can actually, you know, or, or, or definitely I'm not a tarot card reader or I cannot really actually, you know, do fortune telling. But yes, uh, lots of things are going to change. But yes, again, uh, we always had this kind of doomsday scenario that, you know, um, things are going to change and we're going to be out of jobs. But yes, you would be definitely on some different aspects. And, and definitely new jobs will pan out. I mean, the legal profession is not going to end. Only thing it's going to transform. And, 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 and humans are going to be at pivotal stage in that transformation. They're going to be part of that. You know, unless and until there is singularity. Uh, so so I, I, I hope I've addressed that. So can we move on to the next one? I, I know, I mean, it's not going to be specific. But yes, I mean, it's, it's just actually a rough outline I can give you. I don't have specific answers because... AI yeah, is something which is absolutely nobody has a clear cut answer. And if somebody tells you there is an answer for it, I'm sorry, no, it's not. But at the most, you can have a rough outline. That's all. Okay, sir. The next question is um, Can authoring a book using Chat GPT be infringement of copyright? Infringement of copyright. Authoring a book now, using Chat GPT. Yes. Chat GPT, again, actually, it comes to has been curating a lot of data. Chat GPT itself is based on a large language model and itself is actually having a suit in US actually where New York Times has actually sued them for, you know, uh, having access to a large data sets which they did not have access to. But again, it comes to fairness. You know, I mean, I mean, you have this issue in uh, what is fair in co copyright, you know, I mean, I mean, basically it's the same thing when it comes to students having access to copyright material. Can you utilize that material for... Uh, improvement for legal studies and and here also it is actually you know basically you are utilizing that data for better outcomes for improving better machine learning better outcomes so copyright as such when you author a thing but when you pass it off then it is called unethical because basically you have to highlight that you have utilized chat gpt to come out with this kind of outcome okay so basically, if you use chat GPT, uh, it will be unethical. You can't call that your copyright because, again, it comes to, uh, you know, employer-employee relationship, which is not, you are basically not a subscriber. You are utilizing chat GPT 3.5 for free. So I, I would not say that you will basically have, and you will be basically using certain key terms on which you are the large language models would be processing that data and giving you an, an outcome so but it would be unethical but infringement of data i would not say that unless a fair usage is involved okay so i would not say that it is ethical to use that data you will have to highlight it that you have used ai models to generate that kind of uh, outcome that would be a proper thing but uh, how do you know actually utilizing chat gpt chat gpt itself is based on a model which is actually curated and extracted from a lot of different data sources. Yeah, so can we go on to the next so one? So the last question for the day. Thank you. Uh, can a government in a democracy ban the adoption of technology? For instance, Union Minister Nitin Gadkari mentioned that he would not allow automi automatic cars to come to India as a lot many, most of the drivers would become unemployed problem is actually <laughs> i would not get involved into the politics of ai but the problem is actually i think so saving lives is more important than actually employability right actually the whole kind of scenario in which actually the kind of road accidents which takes place on indian roads are just tremendous i mean what how many two lakh individuals die every year actually that's the rough data which i can recollect two lakh individuals die by road, way of road accidents and if you actually look at 2 lakh, means actually it's basically a genocide, right? Uh, and if you can save those lives by utilizing AI, I don't think so. I, I mean, drivers, and, and this is the problem actually, uh, in most of the developing countries, 
we only look at AI for immediate redressal of problems and looking at past and being nostalgic. You can be, you know, I mean, uh, what do you call it, uh, conservatively progressive, or you can be a traditionalist and look back at past and say that these are the kind of employment, you know, generating avenues which were there and we will not utilize AI because there will be unemployment. There will be unemployment, there will be upskilling, you'll have to train people for uh, some other avenues, but banning, definitely not a solution. And no government should ever actually do that. Because, I mean, you don't want winter AI. Already, India is an AI laggard. No matter what we say, we are having ample of data, but the problem is actually having access to that data. And, you know, and, I mean, basically, government data is only related to certain aspects of identity cards or certain things. It does not have the kind of experiential data which is possessed by Google or by Amazon or any of these tech platforms which they have. You know, the kind of data. We only have certain identity data which we have or maybe patient data and, and things. And, and just imagine actually, you know, a company, somehow, somehow a big platform company going to a medical hospital and, you know, giving a fabulous PowerPoint presentation would just immediately have access to all the patient data. So, yes, I mean, I mean, you don't want a winter AI. You don't want a, a kind of slow mechanism in which actually you you will not, you know, give access to data. See, this, this is the problem, actually. Uh, you don't want this kind of, uh, what do you call it, entry barriers. If you want real competition, you want real industries to sum up and come up you will not use this kind of uh, entry barriers where you ban things and you do that. It's definitely a strict no. I mean, I mean, businesses ought to have access to data. Uh, there has to be a thing called free trade, free competition, and that's very pivotal, very important for a country like India. You know, I mean, basically that's how we have we are going to really progress economically, socially, and uh, you know, uh, e even in terms of actually legal access. Thanks for addressing it. So, the participant is asking, can you repeat the websites that one can use for legal research? <laughs> yeah, definitely, actually, not a problem. Uh, I think so. One is actually, uh, I think so. I mentioned uh, Gavel, uh, Gavel document. Actually, previously it was, it was called a document. There is a software called Legal Sifter. Okay, there is there is a software called Contract Pod AI. There is uh, Law Geeks. There is a software called Law Geeks, and it's basically a contract review software. There is uh, Kira Systems, I think. So, Amarchan Mangaldas, or, or maybe Cyrus. Cyrus uh, Mangaldas actually uh, has adopted, or they have licensed actually Kira Systems. Um, and uh, uh, there is Westlaw Edge, there is LexisNexis Context and uh, case text and Ross intelligence. So I I think so, I, and most of the softwares are Western softwares, uh, applications, and you can actually mold them. But again, as I said, it's subscription based. So please understand it's, it's a very costly affair. Basically still having a three year and five year law course has really helped you in terms of analytical skills. It has helped you in terms of that. Utilize chat GP to formulate statements to do that or to have basic uh, precedence in law and utilize your own uh, skill sets to actually modify and improve those particular content. Over-reliance on contract drafting on certain AI and not being subject specific to a country like India can do can lead to certain problems. Okay, so that comes with a disclaimer. Uh, I hope I've addressed most of the things. So, sir, the last question. Um... So are you aware about, uh, you know, artists and writers opposed against use of AI by Hollywood studios? So partic yeah. participant That's wants you to is. shed light on it if you are aware. Yeah, I'm, I am aware of it. And actually, uh, creativity itself is actually, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, transforming. And uh, when it comes to Hollywood, I will not actually, because it is studio specific, it is not actually artists which are independent. So uh, they, they have come to a solution where actually they are not, you know, at present, I, I, I doubt it actually this kind of moratorium in which actually artists are going to say that, no, we are not going to actually, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, utilize certain imaging softwares or, or utilize large language models for generation of, uh, you know, uh, text uh, for dialogue writing and script writing. Uh, I, I, I think so 
down the line, I mean, uh, it's it's all about economics. Uh, studios are down the line going to utilize, you know, AI for writing certain scripts. There's definitely actually uh, not an end to that solution. So uh, uh, temporary moratoriums or things are definitely not uh, an answer to it. You know, it's 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 down the line. Uh, you will have to reskill. You will have to actually transform. You'll have to actually, you know, uh, do something something altogether different from what you are currently doing. Culture industry, yes, it's going to transform, but I don't think so. Actually, uh, uh, sitting out here in Mumbai and actually, you know, giving an opinion, I don't think so. It is doing justice. Issues are very different, but yes, whenever it comes to technology, I myself am biased. And I would like to have all the platforms access to all the kind of data. Yes, there will be certain employability problems, especially when it comes to utilizing large-scale models. But down the line, I don't think so. It's, it's evident that uh, AI is going to change the whole facet of how we work. Because work itself was in 18th, 19th, and I would say that 19th and 20th century concept. Prior to that, we were an agrarian society in which actually you know, work itself was not something, it was season-based. The rest of the time, we were idle. Uh, it's it's only when the industrial age started that you have this concept of 9 to 5 or you have this concept of actually, you know, this whole 9 to 5 concept. And that itself is being transformed right now. It's it, The transformation is in motion. So that's that's all I can say. And uh, yes. <laughs> you know, okay, sir. Yeah. Thank I, I know you it's, so it's, much. <laughs> it, it's circumlocutory, but I, I seriously I have no answer for that because... Uh, this is this is this is a reality it's transforming it's changing and and you cannot go back and have and be nostalgic how things were you know that's that's the only answer i can give you'll have to transform you'll have to change you'll have to upskill and you'll have to be a student for life so 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 don't be actually you know kind of a doomsday scenario but it's it's down the line if you are actually following what whatever's happening in this particular AI arena, you will definitely actually, you know, stand up to the challenge, which are, which is there. So, so you are a tech optimistic. I'm a tech optimist. Yes, I am. I mean, I mean, yes. if, I, I think so. Most of us have to be, I mean, uh, have to be, yeah, have to be, have to be actually. And if you look at the data, it signifies that optimists have all, always, you know, they have come down with, uh, you know, come out with flying colors, actually. Uh, <laughs> Uh, whether it was computers, whether it was industrial technology, everything transformed and, and life is much better right now. We have longevity, we have better medical access, everything has changed. So AI is going to augment our abilities. So so let's let's not actually, you know, say that AI is a doomsday scenario, it's going to be an optimist ability. So with that note, I would uh, say thank you. It's been a wonderful session and uh, you have my email if anyone else wants to communicate, not a problem anyway. Thank you so much, sir, for such an insightful webinar. It was a great learning experience. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.